Ja allesammans, varmt välkomna till Timbro, ska ni vara. Jag hoppas att lunchen har smakat. Eh, det här seminariet som vi arrangerar är idag, ska jag säga, är inte bara ett Timbro-arrangemang utan något som vi har haft glädjen att samarrangera med Fria Moderata Studentförbundet och Hugo Selling som sitter här framme och som kommer att möta upp mig här framme för frågestunden efter det här seminariet. Och det kommer kanske inte som en jättestor överraskning för mig att det här seminariet också har tilldragit sig ett mycket stort intresse. Det blev fullsatt på bara några dagar. Eh, och det är ju inte så konstigt, för liberalismen har väl inte varit så omdiskuterad och kritiserad, i alla fall inte så länge jag har varit politiskt medveten. Och det är en diskussion och en typ av utmaningar som jag tror att vi gör bäst i att inte lämna bara åt våra kritiker. Så so I am very honored to welcome Dr. Tom Palmer one of the most prominent voices within the libertarian, global libertarian movement, I would have to say, and a long-standing friend of Timbro. So by way of introduction, Dr. Palmer is uh, the George M. Yeager Chair for Advancing Liberty and the Executive Vice President for International Programs at the Atlas Network, of which Timbro is also a proud member. Uh, Dr. Tom Palmer is also a senior fellow at Cato Institute and director of Cato University and previously a fellow at Oxford University, as well as vice president of the Institute of Humane Studies at George Mason University. And if I were to tell the audience something about all the books you've written, we would be here all day. So it will just have to suffice with saying that you're also a prolific writer of many splendid books that you should all read. We are immensely pleased to have you here today, um, and I personally look very much forward to listening uh, to you discuss the rather dire subject of liberalism and the alt-right threat and engage in a fruitful discussion on how we should cope with the challenges that we face as a movement fighting for liberty, but also as members of a free society. So, Tom, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Karen, it's really an honor to be here, and I have been an admirer of both uh, the uh, Free, Free Moderato Student Verbundet and Timbro, going back to the 1980s, and both of these organizations are very helpful to me in the Soviet Union when we were smuggling in books and photocopiers and fax machines, getting things translated into Russian and Polish and Bulgarian and many other languages, and Timbro and the Free Moderata uh, Student Verbundet we're great allies in this, and I will be forever grateful for that. Uh, to talk about this alt-right threat, I thought the first thing, instead of going into how to combat it, is to say, what is it? Where did this come from? So I'm going to be dealing with some intellectual history as well as some sociology and some contemporary politics. Now the first point is I think that we're witnessing right now three symbiotic ideological movements that are uh, uh, opposing classical liberalism or libertarianism. And what's interesting is they see each other as the enemy, but they in fact symbiotes. Uh, identity politics and the zero-sum mentality in the United States, they call it political correctness and social justice warriors, what we've seen on college campuses, debate being shut down, uh, populism and yearning for an authoritarian regime led by a strong man, and the alt-right is very much tied into that. And then radical political Islamism. Each one thinks the other two are enemies, but in fact they're allies. Because what's happening is as one grows, it gives fuel to the others. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. The alt-right partly is a response to the takeover of many institutions by the politically correct or socially just left that has uh, engendered this uh, equally ugly response. So as one grows, it gives fuel to the others. And what happens is what we call the libertarian middle, people who just want to live together peacefully, that space is actually shrinking in the politics of many countries, certainly in the United States. Now, I think that we're entering an era of conflict, and there are people who yearn for it, they live for it, they're angry, they want to be angry, and anger fuels hatred, which fuels opposition to liberalism. It's not logically incompatible per se, but it is psychologically incompatible with a free society when large elements of the population hate each other. They say, we cannot live together. 
And so these movements are fueling this very robustly. Uh, they don't want equality before the law. They like a politics based on unequal identity. And there are right-wing versions and left-wing versions of this unequal identity politics. They don't believe in your right to disagree, and they definitely will not defend your right to do so. Uh, the intellectual leaders, this is a very important point, uh, they're not just primitive thugs. It's a mistake to write these movements off as tattooed skinheads. Their leaders are often very well read, one could even say cultured. They are intellectuals, the leaders of all the fascist and communist movements in the 1930s and the 20th century were intellectuals. They motivated and moved uh, tattooed skinheads and thugs, but the leaders were intellectuals. And often they do understand classical liberal ideas fairly well. They read them and they reject them. They're opposed to them. It's not a lack of knowledge. They don't need another seminar on how, how prices work in a market economy. That's not the problem. They understand the classical liberal perspective and they reject it as hollow, and empty. Trade is a zero-sum game. International trade is a plot against the nation or the working class or whatever collectivity they represent. They denigrate democratic uh, politics. It's a fraud. A debate is a sham. The underlying reality of life is eternal antagonism and conflict. This is uh, their worldview. They do not want to live and let live fundamental rejection of a liberal principle of toleration and mutual respect. <clears throat> and we have left-wing flavors and right-wing flavors of this. Now this alt-right movement has resurrected ideas of collective identity that we thought were gone in 1945. And uh, at my age, I'm quite shocked to see this movement re-emerging that most of us thought was, was finished. And it was merely on the extreme fringes of crazy groups. Well, now we're seeing it entering into much more mainstream discourse and even positions of political power. So let me start a little bit with the identity politics of the left. And one of the most influential figures, Herbert Marcuse, he wrote a very powerful essay in 1965 on repressive tolerance. The most brutal form of repression is toleration because you tolerate people saying things that aren't true. And that is the greatest oppression you can suffer. He was a Heideggerian Marxist, a particularly loathsome combination of ideas. And he said to achieve true liberation, it requires the withdrawal of toleration of speech and assembly from groups and movements which promote a long list of things he doesn't like, chauvinism, armament, discrimination, and so on which oppose the extension of public services, and so on. The restoration of freedom of thought may necessitate new and rigid restrictions on teachings and practices in the educational institutions, which by their very methods and concepts serve to enclose the mind, etc., etc. This is what we are now experiencing on college campuses. It is playing out Marcuse's story. Deplatforming people, telling people you mustn't be allowed to speak, Professors are shouted down and even physically assaulted. Uh, it's not uh, uh, a total zoo in American colleges or Canadian colleges, but it's getting there. And increasingly, uh, robust conversation and debate is shut up. You're not allowed to say things that are not approved. Now, Marcuse was a, a quite a interesting figure uh, he appeared most recently in the Coen Brothers movie, Hail Caesar, which I highly recommend. It was an immensely funny movie, and they really send up Marcuse uh, very effectively as leading a strike on the part of millionaire screenwriters, screenwriters in Hollywood, demanding that they be not exploited and be given the full value of their work. Uh, in fact, he wasn't a very comic figure. He left a poisonous legacy of violent suppression of speech. We should have intolerance even toward thought, opinion, and word. Cancellation of the liberal creed of free and equal discussion. And what he argued here is we're in involved in a calculated choice between two forms of political violence. And that's very interesting. Toleration is violence. There's no difference between hanging someone for having views you don't like 
and not hanging them. They're both forms of violence. He cannot conceive of a world in which I let someone speak freely and disagree with me. That's just as repressive because I allow that person to poison the minds of others. So he said this conflict between his totalitarian vision and liberalism was just a choice between two forms of political violence. So they see liberal ideas as just another kind of violence. Very different conception from how liberals conceive of these matters. Uh, the consequence now we've seen on American college campuses, we condemn freedom of speech. Well, okay. Uh, the identity politics of the left has been playing out on American college campuses. There was a, a wonderful uh, image that was videotaped by a student reporter who wanted to cover it, and this professor says, who wants to help me get this reporter out of here? I need some muscle over here. She was professor of journalism at the University of Missouri. Uh, this was Professor Charles Murray, was not allowed to utter a single word at Middlebury College. Uh, racist, sexist, anti-gay, Charles Murray, go away. I don't think he is these things, but it rhymes, <laughs> so that works. Uh, your message is hatred, we cannot tolerate it. And they physically assaulted him and the professor, who was a left of center professor, who said, we want to have a conversation, and she was sent to hospital uh, because of the attack on her. Uh, we condemn freedom of speech that hurts other people's feelings. That's a form of violence in this mentality. You're committing violence if you hurt my feelings. Now that, what I would consider politically correct insanity, has created a market for a provocative reaction. This has opened the door for what has now uh, emerged. And think about this fellow, Milo Yiannopoulos from Britain. He's a consummate internet troll. Uh, he believes in vulgar provocation. I have no idea what this means. It's just provocative. He also says it doesn't mean anything. It's just there to anger people. He wants an angry response. Uh, he's the perfect carrier for this message. He's uh, openly gay, and so they say, how could he be a bigot? How could he be a bigot? He's gay. Right? And I was in a debate recently on this topic. They said, he married a black man. He can't be racist. He can't be. I said, you know, that's a very good point. Racists do not have sex with black people. We know that. Look at the history of the American South. <laughs> it's proof, right? The racist slave masters would not have sex with the black slaves. Of course not. I do not find this convincing that he, in fact, has not introduced racist ideas into discourse. Here he is calling for building the wall. Now, he does have one point that I think is worth making, but not in this way. He says that freedom from ever being challenged in anything, freedom from ever having to encounter something with which you might disagree or make you uncomfortable, the definition of freedom that has taken hold on the left in America today is poisonous. And I think this is a smart point. Unfortunately, it's been embedded in a whole series of other points that are not compatible with a, a liberal message. But this attracted many people uh, to his approach. Uh, he brought into this mainstream this alt-right on Breitbart uh, magazine and introduced this man to the public. Uh, his name is Richard Spencer. He's a National Socialist <laughs> and quite unabashed about it. Now I'll give you some uh, images of that. Uh, Yiannopoulos knew this. We now know from thousands of Breitbart emails that were released by an angry employee released them to the media, he was 100% aware of this. He denied it before, so I had no idea they were really Nazis. Well, now we have the emails, and he did. He was fully aware of this. And here he said to Joel Stein at Business Week about Spencer going with him on all of his college campus tours, I don't see it as a bad thing that I surround myself with edgy people. So Nazis are just edgy people now. They're just, they're sort of fun, they're edgy, they're provocative. Because they're interesting. I'm not going to not hang out with someone because the New York Times calls him racist. Well, how about when he calls himself racist? 
you still want to hang out with him? So not just the New York Times. He is an avowed open racist who talks about ethnic cleansing, expulsion of the Jews, genocide, bloody creation of an ethno state by expulsion of all the non-white people uh, from his uh, country. Here he is uh, at a rally. This was with his backers. Hail Trump, hail our people, hail victory. This is not subtle. Hail victory is Sieg Heil. So this is not particularly deniable what he was going on about. Uh, as he has put it, the most important aspect of identity is race. One could have psychological discussion about what kind of person would see it that way. That you don't have anything of yourself personally that individuates yourself. You identify instead with a race. We need an ethno state so our people can come home again. Maybe it will be horribly bloody and terrible. Okay. That's just a kind of toss off. After having said, of course, it'll be voluntary. And the journalist said, well, what happens if people don't leave? He says, oh, well, then it'll be really bloody. So, okay. I think I understand the message there. So what we've seen is one identity politics calling forth another. And as all of these are forms of collectivism, they come with all the other elements of collectivism. Zero-sum mentality, a penchant for violence, and of course, statism, or the worship of the state as the embodiment and also of a great leader. Now this new right wing, this alt-right, has taken a number of different names. It's called identitarian in many European countries, race realist, that's a a new buzzword for racist, human biodiversity that sounds scientific. What it means is there are different races of humans. Humans are biodiverse, right? So it seems scientific. Traditionalist with a big T, and it's not what you may think. It does not mean the family gets together with a Yule log and has family traditions. It means something very different. I'll talk about that in a moment and the alt-right. They have their conferences, their publishing houses, books that have come out now in the last 10 years in virtually every European language, in Finnish and Swedish and Greek and Italian and Spanish and Slovak. Huge amount of money and resources pouring into this. And we know where some of it is coming from. It's coming from the Kremlin, which is financing this movement uh, very, very heavily. Militant identitarian groups are marching for power in Europe. So this is not just in some salon. These are political movements as well. Uh, this is a leader of the Slovak parliament out on a hiking expedition hmm. with the party leaders. This is the Golden Dawn. Uh, this is, of course, a traditional Greek insignia. Any resemblance to any other political insignia in European history is accidental, uh, purely uh, accidental. This is the Mojar Garda of the Jobbik party in Hungary, which is very strongly identified with alt-right ideology. Now, such figures as Jared Taylor, he says, the leftists and minorities have safe spaces. Why can't we? Why can't we? They want to be among themselves, and we white people can say, well, we just want to be among white people. What's wrong with that? Other groups can have a preference for their own culture and heritage. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, yes, I prefer the culture of Europe, and I prefer to be around white people. So that's all. Seems presented something just perfectly reasonable. All we want is a white country. It's a small thing to ask for, the expulsion of all the other groups. Now, there's been a huge revival of national socialist and fascist thinking, and this has been building for some time. Uh, and I want to introduce you to some very influential thinkers of the 20th century who've laid the foundation for this. Uh, we thought their political thoughts had disappeared in 1945. Not the case. But I'll also introduce you to a lesser-known thinker who's bringing their ideas back. So let's go through them. Uh, Ernst Junger, Karl Schmidt, Martin Heidegger, and Julius Evola. And these figures are known among the certain high intellectual alt-rightists, but the first three are very influential in contemporary academic life. 
Start with Martin Heidegger, noted philosopher. Uh, here he was as an earlier day. He never gave up wearing his party pin until 1945, by the way. Um, here he was at a meeting of the deans of the universities. He was uh, rector of Freiburg University. Here's Carl Schmidt. Carl Schmidt, very dapper lawyer, very interesting person, uh, quite intelligent. Here he was in his old age in the Plettenberg. Uh, here he was in Paris with Ernst Jünger, involved in German military intelligence uh, in Paris. Very active uh, Nazis, both of them. Jünger also an arch enemy of liberalism, and his approach was to use art against uh, liberty. Jünger's book on pain, I recommend reading these, by the way. He was a great artist. So again, I don't denigrate the intellectual power of these people. In Stahlgewittern is one of the greatest books of the First World War. It is a celebration of war and violence. His essay on pain, we can say with some certainty the world of the self-gratifying and self-critical individual is over. That's liberalism. It's over. Its system of values, if no doubt still widespread, has been overthrown in all decisive points or refuted by its own consequences. He had written early on in support of the uh, Nazi party <clears throat> what they would uh, carry out. The dictatorship will replace word with deed, ink with blood, the phrase with sacrifice, and the pen with the sword. This is the image. This is the alternative to liberalism. Not ink, but blood. Not the pen, but the sword. And not words, but deeds. Here he is as an elderly, beloved figure. He died a green, naturally, in Germany, well known for collecting hourglasses. Uh, he was one of the most influential critics of liberalism in the 20th century. And he introduced an artistic dimension that was quite powerful. Heidegger sent a kind of a poison pill to the future. The Heidegger archives, under the absolute control of his family, released his material very, very slowly over long periods of time. All of the Nazi material was in the archives from 1945 until about 10 years ago. And he understood, I'm convinced, he knew what he was doing. He was sending it into the future because those ideas could not be discussed in the 1950s or 60s or 70s. And he specified these books will come out much later. And now that they're appearing, we realize he was a Nazi despite all the denials. It's simply undeniable. In his essay on logic, which as far as I can tell has nothing to do with logic but everything to do with race, lectures, <clears throat> Uh, we have the advantage that the question of who we ourselves are is timely, as distinguished from the time of liberalism, the I time. Now is the we time. Collectivism. Very robustly articulated. Now Schmidt, who was a friend of his, they participated in the de-Jewification of the universities in a conference that called for the expulsion not only of Jews as professors and students and of books written by Jews from the libraries but of books containing Jewish ideas. So I'm taking it really quite far in that regard. And Schmidt, who is a leading juridical thinker of the Third Reich, defined what politics is, their distinction between friend and enemy. That is what political life is. It's defined by friend and enemy. In the book, he criticizes liberal thinkers, Franz Oppenheimer and Joseph Schumpeter, he understood them. He was a deeply intelligent and thoughtful person. And in every case, he takes the illiberal, anti-liberal side uh, when there is a discussion. What's interesting here is he talks a lot about enemies, but not very much about friends. But the message is you can't have friends unless you have enemies. It's what brings us together. It's what makes us friends is we confront enemies. It's another key message of collectivism. Hatred of the other, of the enemy, which is what gives us our identity. And finally, Evola. Evola was uh, fairly marginal at the time. He was very close to Mussolini and the SS. Uh, Mussolini considered him a bit of an extremist, by the way. That tells you something about 
his own fascism, as he wrote, what we want is a really absolute fascism made of pure force and accessible to compromise. He considered Mussolini too soft, democratic, and bourgeois. Uh, power should be absolute, and the true leader must embody and represent absolute power. And as he pointed, it's a long quote here, but what we want is to establish the true state, an anti-liberal, anti-democratic, and organic state. This is a book reissued in 1972, shortly before his death in 1974. Now, none of these people were tricked into National Socialism or fascism. They understood very, very well. Heidegger, after the war, and all of his defenders on the academic left said he was this befuddled professor. He had no idea. It was unbelievable. And we now know this is not true. He was well aware of what he was involved in. And he hid it in being in time out in plain sight. As he talked about the hidden basis of Dasein's historicality. The point was, when you dig into being in time, and I read it three times, after which I almost committed suicide each time. It was a very difficult uh, book. Uh, you finally realize Dasein does not mean your existence and mine. It's das deutsche Volk. That's the only Dasein he's interested in. Das deutsche Volk. <coughs> Now, a number of the themes that they articulated are back. Authenticity, struggle and conflict, identity and tradition, blood and soil, which we've heard as slogans recently. Hierarchy, polylogism, one logic for whites, another for blacks, Jews, Gentiles, men, women, etc., etc. Impossible to discuss. And this manly bonds, the menabunda which is the outright is very enthusiastic about this idea of warrior bands of masculine, manly men um, doing manly things, which usually means beating up other people. Now, these, uh, figure, these ideas have been introduced by this man very robustly with the backing of staggering sums of money uh, from the Kremlin. He's the founder of the National Bolshevik Party, which he later left as you in Russia. As you can see, they... Their emblem, they promised to offer the best of Stalin and Hitler. So this is a quite robust kind of collectivism. Uh, here he is more recently with his dear friend, David Duke in Moscow. I don't know if you know who David Duke is, leader of the Ku Klux Klan in the United States of America. Uh, and here he is at one of his rallies. They have a very active website. Here's his book on Martin Heidegger published by Richard Spencer and translated from Russian by Richard Spencer's wife. So these are very closely connected uh, movements. They have uh, active websites in multiple languages, and he's a very prolific, very intelligent uh, person. I think he's completely mad, but very intelligent. Now these ideas have now been introduced into American politics. Steve Bannon, this man here, we're the platform for the alt-right. And he denied understanding what these ideas are about afterwards. But now we have a tranche of emails released to the media by an angry Breitbart employee. Do not mistreat your employees, <laughs> because they will release all of your emails. <laughs> and what did we find? Well, first off, his casual mentions of Julius Evola in the past that were kind of deniable. He said, oh, this Dugan fellow is very much influenced by Evola. But here he says, I do appreciate any piece that mentions Evola, which is a suggestion he knew much better what Evola thinks. This was not just some casual awareness. He was encouraging the writers more Evola, more Evola introduced into a very influential right wing, very close to the Trump administration uh, news source. Now, the brutality that the alt right promotes is always drenched in irony. They love all of these memes. They're very um, allegedly funny. Uh, Pepe the Frog, here he is as Donald Trump. Here he is uh, putting someone into a gas chamber. Uh, here he is as a Nazi stormtrooper. They have this image of Keck, all these internet memes, which are available so they can laugh off the National Socialism that they're deeply involved in. Uh, 
Red pilling, this goes from the movie The Matrix, very important to certain parts of youth culture. You take the red pill and you see reality as it really is. And the real world is one of conflict, one in which the Jews are oppressing us, in which blacks are our enemy, on and on and on. That is the real world, once you take the red pill. So they'll talk about, he was red-pilled, or when I first started to go red-pilling. What it means is opening their eyes to the reality of racial and ethnic conflict. And then this uh, Milo Yiannopoulos uh, uh, revealing the, the um, photo gallery of the Twinkies for Trump, which is um, young, shirtless gay men with Trump buttons and hats on, saying, make America great. Here he is at one of his college rallies. All ironical, but it's all with the purpose. The irony is a sugar coating to a poison pill. It's an effective means of deniability. When you point this out, they say, oh, you didn't get the joke. Don't you see? It's a big joke. That having a trash dove, which is a kind of internet meme, with swastikas on it, it's just a joke. Don't, don't you get it? Ha ha. And so it's all terribly amusing. But it is a very effective, effective vehicle for promoting National Socialism and youthful online culture. We live in an irony-soaked age. And anyone who thinks fascism would come back like it did exactly in the 1930s is mistaken. There's no reason you would gather tens of thousands of people to march in uniform in the street. You gather them on the internet today. The technology has changed. This is where it's taking place. And it's being done in this ironic form. And you can hide the message from all the grown-ups. Many of you, like me, have to scratch your heads and say, what is going on here? What kind of code language are they using? So you can have a code to ha hide your Nazi messages from others. And you can spread the message of racism and violence. As Evola put it, one of their heroes, their, his books are now out, out in so many languages, you find them at all the alt-right conferences and events. The highest instrument of the inner awakening of race is combat. And war is its highest expression. This is the message that they're promoting. But in a way that the grown-ups don't notice because of the irony and the internet memes and so on. But it was introduced into a speech by this man. You may recognize him. This is the first time I've ever seen an American president do that, by the way. Never seen it before at an inaugural address. Waving, but never this, which is a very different message from waving. At the bedrock of our politics, I should say this is a very chilling inaugural address. It, really, it shocked even me. I did not expect this despite my low expectations for Mr. Trump, he managed to go far lower. A total allegiance to the United States of America. Does that sound familiar to you? I've never heard that from an American politician. Total allegiance to the United States of America. And through our loyalty to our country, we will rediscover our loyalty to each other. When America is united, America is totally unstoppable. We will no longer accept politicians who are all talk and no action, constantly complaining but never doing anything about it. The time for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. That reminded me of this author and what he warned us about in The Road to Serfdom, Friedrich Hayek, in his important 1944 book. It is the general demand for quick and determined central government action that is the dominating element in the situation. Dissatisfaction with the slow and cumbersome course of democratic processes, which make action for action's sake the goal. It is then the man or the party who seems strong and resolute enough to get things done, who exercises the greatest appeal. I think it's a very powerful warning about the rhetorical appeal of dictatorship. Who wrote the speech that I just read? A moment ago, Steve Bannon, the one who loves Evola so much and who seems to be well acquainted with his thinking because it was distilled into the inaugural address of the American president. And I'll conclude with the importance of reviving liberal co cosmopolitanism. 
and ask whether we can do it. Ludwig von Mises, in his 1927 book, put it very neatly. Liberal thinking always has the whole of humanity in view, not just parts. It does not stop at limited groups and at the border of the village, the province, the nation, the continent. Its think is cosmopolitan and ecumenical. All men and the whole world. In this sense, humanism. And the liberal, a citizen of the world, a cosmopolite. Today, 1927, when the world is dominated by anti-liberal ideas, cosmopolitanism is suspect in the eyes of the masses. And I fear we're entering a similar time that Mises was talking about at that time. That the idea of human rights as such, the idea that people can live together peacefully, the idea of voluntary trade as bringing nations and group together is very much under attack by identitarianism, by nationalism, by racism, by protectionism, and by all the other elements that we uh, saw in the past. So I don't predict it will be as bad as we saw in the past, but I'm very worried about the direction our country and our world, I'm going to say our country, I apologize, yours also, uh, and Europe. I'm very worried about the direction that so many places are taking, the politics of hatred, of opposition, of unwillingness to live together or to listen to one another. I'm most interested in your thoughts and how we can revive liberalism at its best. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Tom. Would you like to start? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for a very interesting piece. I had the pleasure to listen to you once earlier at the European Students for Liberty conference on a different topic. It was very interesting then as well. Uh, what I find very hard and um, to grasp with the uh, alt-right is to make a clear distinction between different phenomena and different movements in uh, today's politics. For instance, uh, no, no one I know who is uh, alt-right would really say that proudly with this context in, in, in mind. And, and where do you draw the line between regular populism, which has been on the rise in Europe for a very long time before alt-right, uh, and fascism, and this ironical phase that we're in at the moment. And I think it's a very, uh, I think it's very, um, a very actual and very uh, urgent topic to discuss because uh, in the conservative and in the classical liberal movement, uh, a lot of people lay claim to, to this. Uh, and the alt-right movement is laying claim to classical liberalism or at least minor monopolies and the alt-right movement is laying claim to true conservatism. So where would you draw like a distinction? Because I don't think that anyone would uh, say that, oh, I'm a fascist and alt-right, uh, but there is a gray spectrum uh, towards that end. Uh, that's a whole lot of questions uh, inter that, that are interwoven. Uh, first off, the question of populism. I think all the right ideas are provide the content for populist impulses. Jan Werner Müller has a, a fairly new book on populism that I found very helpful. He says the key element, the defining characteristic of populism as such, is the idea that this populist party or leader is the only one that represents the true people. Only they represent the people. The others are not the people. So we distinction between the real people and the not people. And by the way, last May, or May of uh, 2016, pardon me, President Trump articulated that perfectly, uh, unconsciously, as, as with everything else. He just blurted it out. He gave a speech and he said, the only important thing is the unification of the people because the other people don't mean anything. I said, that's it. That's populism, right in a nutshell. And so the other people who don't mean anything, you don't dialogue with them, you don't compromise, you don't try to have a democratic discussion with them. And the alt-right comes along and gives the content. It's like the little, it's the software, if you want to think of it that way, that helps to divide the real people from the not real people. And the real people are the ones who are, you could have various lists, it might include only the Christians or at a deep level, many of them are pagans, by the way, and reject Christianity as a Jewish uh, religion, the kind of deep, deep ones. 
uh, are deeply anti-Christian because they don't like the universalist message normally associated with Christianity. But somehow we def- decide who are the real people. And that will vary from country to country. In Hungary, this is going on right now. The Roma are not the Hungarians. They're not the real people. We should expel them. They've only been living here, their families, uh, since the, uh, uh, about the 14th century. So get rid of them. Uh, the fascism element is something that slips in. It's what the real leaders of the movement believe. They get it. But most people who find it attractive, they don't understand that. What they're led to, though, is step by step into a movement based on hatred. There was a Swedish, I don't know if he's a journalist or an activist, who infiltrated this alt-right movement in England and America. Rather brave. He managed to pass as one of them, and they thought he was wonderful because he's Swedish. I mean, how more Aryan can you get? So he's, he's got to be one of us. And he passed for a year. It must have been very uncomfortable. But he also recorded them. And what is it that these people say? And these are people who have been in the White House and connected to leading British political figures. What do they say when they think they're among friends? Of course, the Jews have to go. Well, it won't be like before, but we have to expel them all. They have to get out. They're not of us. Blacks have to go. Uh, and in addition, as one of the leaders of, of that Arctos Media and Richard Spencer's business partner and someone who's been to the White House, he says, we look forward to Europe in 2050 when the banknotes have Adolf Hitler on them and he is seen as a great European leader. Now, this is not for public cons- consumption, but when they're amongst themselves, they let it out. I think more people who might find it attractive on the margin should know what's at the core. And that's what I was trying to communicate here. What is at the core of this movement? Uh, Once you take off the lid, I think decent people should recoil in horror. I actually have a follow-up question on the the sort of, if there is a, is there a good populism and a bad populism? Because it seems to me that there is a tension within libertarianism itself, we just republished Thomas Paine, I mean, a libertarian, well, sometimes portrayed as a libertarian revolutionary. Um, and I know that there has been some criticism, at least, at, well, not in particular in the United States, so people are saying that, well, it was actually libertarians that helped get Trump to power because they hated the government so much that they were willing to ally with whomever hated the government as well. Uh, and that was sort of the overarching goal. Uh, is that your view as well? I don't think as a political matter it was, but I do think that there is a problem in the formulation of liberal thinking in the past 20 years, let's say. And that is, and it's something that it, it took me some time to realize, when people say, I'm against the state, I'm anti-government, I'm anti-state, they're making a great mistake. It's not what liberalism is. You are against exertions of unjust power over other people. And the state is the biggest source of that in contemporary society. There's no doubt about that. But what I realized is I'm in favor of liberty. That's not the same as being just against the state. If you eliminate the state, what happens after? We hope it'll be a freer society. It turns out those people didn't care. Murray Rothbard, someone I knew personally, was a very colorful, interesting person. But I think his, his whole moral psychology was very anti-libertarian. He wrote an essay when the South Vietnamese government fell, and I was actually there when it happened in April 1975. And he exulted. He said, it's the death of a state. This is great. A state has died. And I remember I was fairly young then, maybe in my 60s, and... Um, But even at my young age, in 1975, I thought, that can't be right, that we would celebrate the death of a state that's now been conquered by a communist power. How is that in advance for liberty? I don't get it. Uh, Would we have celebrated the death of the Polish state when Hitler and Stalin divided up Poland and made it disappear? The Polish state disappeared to be replaced by the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. Was that a good thing? For Rothbard, it was. And that told me, even at that young age, I said, there's something very wrong with this. I'm not a statist. But what I want is liberty. 
I want the rule of law. I want the institutions of a free society that allow us to live together peacefully. Respect for property, respect for freedom of religion, all those things. What they have is a different mentality that has infiltrated to some extent liberal thinking is smash everything and we don't care what comes after. And I think that's, it's a violation of, of his legacy of Hayek and Mises and Adam Smith and all of the others. What comes after is really the important question. Uh, policy wise, uh, this has co coincided with uh, large scale migration from Middle Eastern countries and also with failure of uh, governmental um, fundamental functions such as the police and the military and, and also public education. At least that's the case in Sweden. And uh, I would say that w one reason why this pop movement has become popular in the center right, uh, not in the center right, but in the libertarian or conservative movement is that the classical liberalism has failed to answer these, the, these issues, at least in the, in the public debate. And how much from the alt-right, if we will take them seriously, for, for once, is actually uh, sound, reasonable policy change, and how much is a slippery slope towards uh, uh, an all-powerful uh, fascist state? Once again, several questions. Yeah, well, but, but, but you touched on a very important point. Uh, looking at it from a, a kind of political sociology perspective, what causes populist movements to arise? Well, it's ideas, of course, but why do these ideas become attractive at, at one time and not at another? And I think periods of rapid social change are probably part of that because people feel that their status has been threatened. I think that's been happening in the United States. The U.S. and Europe are very different in this regard. Uh, the, the huge number of migrants who came into Europe very quickly is a very different phenomenon from the United States. There is no migration crisis in the U.S. It's nonsense. There is in Europe. It really is a different set of circumstances. What we did see in the United States that I think also we could carry out in uh, uh, studies in, in Germany and France, I think we'd see something similar, is that there's been a fall in social status by some elements of the population. And here I'll, I'll digress for a moment. Uh, liberals have talked for a long time about how if, you, if your life becomes better, it doesn't mean it's bad for me. We can both prosper. A rising tide lifts all boats. That's what prosperity is about. And that's a very important story to tell. But I think we're also as social primates who are very concerned with our position in the social ranking, in where I am in society relative to all the others. So if we ranked everyone in this room, I don't know, maybe there's 70 people, 80 people, 100 people here. Let's say it's 100. We rank you, number one, most popular person. Karen, you're it, right? So that's Karen, she's number one, high status all the way down to the lowest status person. I'm the dirty foreigner, that's me. I'm number 100. And all of the rest of you are ranked in between. If I rise in, in the social ranking, somebody has to fall. It's a relative ranking. Now we have celebrated over the past 60 years different groups rising. Women have risen dramatically. They become heads of corporations and banks and universities and think tanks, all sorts of things. Immigrants, minority groups in the United States, black people ended up with a black president. That's pretty much the pinnacle of the, the visible hierarchy in society. Somebody fell. Who was it? White men without a college degree. What's the biggest predictor of being a Trump voter? White male without a college degree. If you have a college degree and you're white, life's been okay. If not, your incomes have risen Dramatically, it's not true that wages have been stagnant. There's no evidence for that. Incomes have gone up, but your status fell, and they resent it. So I think this may be part of the sociological experience, and I think similar things have happened in some parts of Europe. The other thing is, I think that an orderly and reasonable immigration policy is much better than just what happened in Europe. It, it was a little shocking to me that the, the German government had not thro thought through and created a plan they just blurted out, okay, come on in, without even discussing with all the countries in between that perhaps there should be some procedures rather than just having them uh, crossing over in boats and massing at border crossings. Uh, this was handled in a very incompetent way. And what I do favor is government that can do 
things in a competent manner. So this incompetence, I think, did contribute to a big, big backlash. Other elements that have caused problems have been the way in which social payments have been made. I think that was a complete mistake. And so there's huge areas for improvement. But I don't think the answer is to throw out the idea of a liberal society. I think we can improve the institutions of liberal society and do things in a better, more law-governed fashion. Uh, the, the Economist had a very interesting article, I think, the other week about liberalism and its critics. And it basically ended up in saying something very similar to what you were saying, but uh, with a big outcry to say that we need to step up our game. So of all the policy areas that you've just mentioned, which would you say is the most important for the liberal movement to engage in debate on and get better at defending? There are so many. Uh, but I have thought about this question in this context, and I do think that much more robust economic growth is probably one solution to the feeling of insecurity and loss of status. And one of the ways to get that is to get rid of the staggering amount of uh, over-regulatory or intervention in the economy that has, I think, really slowed these things down. So I really have good things to say about Mr. Trump. Uh, but in this area, his administration is not deregulated. That's just not true, by the way. If you read this, they, it's not true. But they have stopped the increase in regulation that we had under eight years of Obama. And that's a good thing. And I think that we're going to see positive uh, consequences from that. Uh, they oversell it. They say, look at what we deregulated. It's just not true when you look at, at all the lists of regulations that keep getting added. But they slowed it down so dramatically from what the Obama administration had been doing. So I think that's a positive thing. I think we need more robust economic growth for working class people to think the future will get better for me and for my children. This is a positive part of a forward-looking free society. Um, there are other elements of rule of law one could address, but I think actually that's one of the biggest ones. It's just policies conducive to more rapid economic growth demand that we see right now for policies to increase social cohesion is not is that a debate that we should engage in at all or is that something that we should just leave to the conservatives no. and to the alt right and to the left the question is what the social cohesion means because when it's carried out by the state or the educational institutions it's likely to lead to more social divisiveness <laughs> the united states has a particularly incompetent set of governmental institutions in this regard and so when you pour money into educational institutions and say, make citizens, uh, A, teachers' wages go up uh, with no increase in teaching, and the number of administrators goes up with no increase in education. If you look at the charts, uh, government expenditure on education does this over the past 40 years, and performance on test scores does this. So this huge difference seems to have had no positive impact whatsoever. So I think that's what's likely to happen. And then the second thing is, uh, I don't think it's going to generate the policies people think. I'm all in favor of a sense of citizenship. Swedish people should have a sense that we are citizens of a free society. We go, we exercise our franchise, we do so responsibly because we care about the future of our country. Quite likely, at the moment, uh, if you pour money into those things, you're going to get more of the ideas that have created social divisiveness. I'll give you one simple example. Uh, when uh, uh, previous Republican administration was in office, they took over the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is a slush fund to pay for all of your friends, uh, depending on what party is in power. <coughs> And they said, we're going to create a new national curriculum based on social cohesion and American citizenship. And Lynn Cheney, the wife of the then vice president, was in charge of it. And she had all these plans. And they put in staggering sums of money to create a national curriculum that teaches that the most important thing the United States ever did was the extermination of the Indians, that the United States is an evil, vicious, hateful, racist society. So it's, it was just all of the political correct curriculum. But it was initiated by a Republican conservative pro-citizenship um, government. And at the time, I told them, I said, you're fooling yourselves if you think you're going to actually change the way that this curriculum is carried out. It's just not going to happen. And indeed, 
uh, it, the whole thing reads as if it was written by Howard Zinn. If you know who he is, he's a Marxist uh, historian, an interesting person, but he has his own view that I'm sure Lynn Cheney did not share. One last question, or do we call it a day? Um, Sure, one last question. Uh, one problem, as we have discussed, is alienation and polarization in society, where we t seem to get further and further away from each other. Uh, and you, you talk about alt-right as the reflection and re the, the counter-reaction towards uh, feminism and, uh, and what's happening at campuses all over the uh, US and now in Europe. How do we get back to uh, what I think that Mises and Hayek would want to have, to seek the good conversation, to seek out your opponent's best argument rather than his worst, rather than calling my opponent's Nazis um, or, or feminazis? Uh, how, how do we get, get back to that? Uh, conversation yeah. in society, I think, would be a huge improvement in trying to combat alt-right and, and other totalitarian policies. How do we go, go there? Yes, I think that that's basically right. One of the nice things I like about Students for Liberty uh, is that they have a positive mentality. They're not an angry organization. So they're all over Europe and Asia and Latin America and North America. And uh, uh, they bring together so many thousands and thousands of students. And they have a cultural, a corporate culture, which is we want to make friends for liberty. We don't want to go have fights with our enemies. The way we win is by taking people who see themselves as our enemies and try to get them to be our friends and to be friends for our values and for the idea of a free society. And I think in the big picture that's uh, the right way to do it. Now, my presentation here was not always the most uh, laudatory. I'm not friends with uh, the alt-right. And I think people like Richard Spencer and so on or Alexander Dugan uh, are unlikely to be convinced to join me on this. Uh, but I would like to encourage people who might have found that on the margins attractive to, to look deeply into it and decide, is this where they want to go? Because once you take the lid off, you see the real ingredients uh, are, are deeply, deeply unattractive. Uh, but in general, in presenting the ideas of the free society, I think it's better to avoid anger, not to get into fights with people, but to win friends for the cause of the free society. And they might be on the left or on the right or up or down or people who are previously non-political. Uh, what we want is to increase the willingness of people to discuss and debate. Re related to that is, uh, I believe, in holding debates on college campuses, real ones. And a real debate is one in which you respect the other person, you listen, you counter with your best arguments, and not a screaming match. And that is, I think, again, what uh, good groups uh, like yours are doing, is to promote actual conversation and discussion. When there's a screaming match, liberal ideas cannot win. We cannot win. I cannot scream louder than they can. I do not want to engage in violence. I cannot win. But if we have a rational conversation, we look to reasons and evidence, I think the liberal case is very, very robust and compelling. And by that, I'm afraid that we will have to call it a day. Thank you so much, Tom, for coming for, and Thank having you. this co fascinating conversation. <laughs>